Hello. <clears throat> I'm Jordan Peterson. I'm a psychologist and a notorious over-talker. So I'm a psychology professor at the University of Toronto and a clinical psychologist. And uh, I've started my career actually as a political scientist, and which I, I stopped pursuing political science when I realized that the methods of political science were insufficient to address the issues that were at the core of the of the problems that we face as political beings. And so I turned instead to science as a way of cutting through the mess, because science does that in ways that people generally don't like, which often indicates that they're actually accurate. Um, one of the things that I've become increasingly interested over the years is in the, the vices that are associated with virtues. Today we talk a lot about sort of heroic vices, you know, sexual attraction, drunkenness, the romantic vices, um, aggression maybe, competition. Um, vice actually isn't very romantic, it's, it's, it's really ugly and it, it hurts people's lives and by that I mean it makes them more rife with suffering than they need to be and they're already plenty rife with suffering so adding to that doesn't seem to be a particularly useful endeavor. And vice often clothes itself in the garb of virtue. And the virtue that I'm concerned about tonight in relationship to vice is the virtue of tolerance. Um, I'm a scientist and a psychoanalyst, and that makes me about as skeptical a person as you could ho possibly hope to meet, because a psychoanalyst never believes that people are doing what they say they're doing, and a scientist never believes that anything that anyone thinks about anything is correct. And that's usually because it isn't. And so a psychoanalytic scientist is, is extremely skeptical, and it's tolerance that deserves to have a substantial light shed on its vicious aspects. Now Jung said, Carl Jung, who I'm a great admirer of, once described an old religious idea, and that was that God ruled the world with two hands, right and left, mercy and justice. And the world couldn't survive if only mercy applied, because then no one would ever be encouraged to adopt the trappings and responsibilities of adulthood. You end up in a situation where you're forgiven for absolutely everything you do or fail to do. You're, you're, you're thrust into the Freudian nightmare of the Oedipal family, where your utter uselessness is forgiven on the grounds of compassion, and you end up living in your mother's basement until you produce fantasies huh, as a consequence of your squelched development of perhaps going out and shooting up a high school. Um, mercy, in its excess, produces pathology. Justice, in its, in its excess, produces pathology too, because people are not are not perfect. And that means that we all fail when we attempt to do the things that we know that we should do. And so being held to account for our failures has to be tempered by mercy, but both principles have to apply. Justice means there's structure and rules, and the people who abide by the structure and play by the rules and move towards the top win. And mercy means we're forgiven our failures so that we can rise up and play again. But you can't have one without the other because the world falls apart if you do. And this is my problem with tolerance. Because tolerant people, first of all, let's say those who claim, proclaim the virtues of tolerance, believe that they're tolerant, but generally that's not the case. They just don't want to accept the responsibility that playing by the rules would bring. And being useless and unable to move towards a valuable goal and failing to hold anyone else accountable as a consequence of their equivalent failures does not make you tolerant. It just makes you unable to move forward in the world in any productive manner. Now, we know that these two axes of value, tolerance, let's say, and justice are associated with two cardinal personality traits. One is agreeableness, and the other is conscientiousness. People on the radical left, politically correct people, 
tend to be very high in agreeableness, but they tend to be very low in conscientiousness. And that begs the question about whether or not their tolerance is a consequence of their avowed love of other people, or their hatred for the fact that any structured society requires adherence to a shared set of ordered beliefs, and the capacity for people to compete within those ordered beliefs to attain, let's say, success or victory. Now, one of the things that we found recently in our research, we've been looking at conservative beliefs. Some of you may be very interested in conservative beliefs given what's happening in the United States with Donald Trump. And we found that the first factor underlying conservative belief is a factor called, we called, my female graduate students called, masculine independence. And it looks like what the, and this is the biggest factor driving political conservatism, by the way, and what it looks like is that there's a pronounced tendency, particularly among men, to erect hierarchies of value and then to compete within them so that they can reach the top. And you might think that that's a, uh, what would you call it, a counterproductive or maybe even counterhuman proclivity, but it's not, and it's partly not because women mate hypergamously, which means that they mate across and up dominance hierarchies, and what that means is that they let men compete among themselves and peel from the top of the victors. And so it's for that reason, by the way, that you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. You might think that's mathematically impossible, but it's not if every woman has one child, and every man who has a child has two, and every man who doesn't has zero, then you end up with twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. Part of what's happening in the United States is an increasing conflict between people of different temperaments. And we don't really understand how to mediate between that anymore. And those who are on the tolerant end of the political distribution tend to think of those who are their opposites as intolerant. But they're not necessarily intolerant. They're also justice-seeking. And justice is one of the hands, as according to Jung, that God uses to keep the world in balance. And so, I guess I'd like to conclude that by pointing out that it's a very rough situation in the political realm when either sides of a temperamental distribution make the a priori proposition that their particular temperament stands for the only virtues that are dominant and ceases to talk to the other side. And we're in that situation right now, and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And one way across that divide is for each of us, depending on our particular political stance and perhaps our inbuilt biological temperament, to note very carefully that just because we think that the way we view the world is, what would you say, uh, virtuous, that doesn't mean it isn't with its attendant vice, and it also doesn't mean that all the vice that we don't have stacks up on the other side of the political distribution. Now, if we insist upon assuming that it does, then we're going to divide the, the West in particular. We're going to divide the West the way that it's be dividing in the United States and the way that it's increasingly dividing in Europe. And that won't be a happy day for any of us. And so I guess I would like to conclude this by saying that vice is a very complicated thing. And the fact that it often comes clothed in the guise of virtue makes it even that much more difficult to understand. But it's necessary to note that even in your moments even in those moments where you think that you're at your best and proclaiming virtues that you think are universal, you may have a blind spot that makes it impossible to talk to people who don't think the same way that you do. And then you might frighten yourself after that realization by coming to understand that people that you can't talk to, you can only fight with. And that's a bad outcome. So, when we're congratulating ourselves on our virtues, we might attend a little bit to our vices, and that might make it easier for us to stretch out our hands and, 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 and to engage in conversation those people who share beliefs that are different than ours that we are increasingly unwilling and unable to talk to. Thank you.